we're going to get started. Um, we're going to do that. Is somebody coming down to do the very charter? I do. Oh, okay. Um, you here for the very charter? I'm just here to. No. Okay. Make sure she's talking about the council. Right. Come after we do that. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Or the reporter is uh, up who we usually ask. And he probably had four Rob there. Yes. And that's Barry City. Yeah. They're not Barry City. Um, they're no, not. Who reported on the The reporter of the bill oh. was. That's who. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, I think it was Rob LeClaire. Okay. Um, and there weren't any issues with it. And um, Carol Dodds said we could call her if we needed to. But, okay, so we'll just go to one, nine, ten, then. Yeah. All right, so um, I guess we have a little bit of time. Yeah, I don't think we have any. Um, we, we don't have any uh, proposed new language, I don't think, on 910. Um, we, get, and we did, we had help from the I ACL think we do, yeah. And, and what about we were going to... Did you, did, did you, you got the one I sent you on Wednesday, right? Yeah, it's okay. posted. Is it in our folders? I got it. Oh, I looked and I thought it was. I think it was. Yeah, it is. Oh, it is? Okay. No, this, this is a longer, better. Oh, there's another version. Yeah, the one I sent you was on Wednesday. Uh, I have the, the initial. Here, this, we is, have, we have this is much here. nicer. This yeah. is much uh, much prettier. Oh, I like pretty. Well, that's important. Oh, very good. Thank you. I have something about a funeral. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we get, we're going to have additional language from ACLU. Um, I don't know if the press was. Yes? Um, uh, Rick, it was the UCA House that submitted some additional language. Do, who did it? If it's submitted to? Uh, to Gail. We talked about it on Wednesday. Is that the okay. PUC? Yeah. yeah. That should be there. And that's in our folder. Okay. Is that the, the court decision? No. No. I don't know who that's from. Looks like that's Here we from go. the Public, public Utility Commission. Sure. Okay. This guy? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. We got that. All right. So let's. Um, First, look at the uh, language from the Public Utilities Commission, if you want to go through that with us. Yep. Good afternoon, folks. I'm Greg Faber with the Public Utility Commission. And we are proposing small change for a small addition to 910, um, which really has to do with our electronic document filing system. Um, we're one of the first agencies, probably the only agency that has an electronic document filing system at this time. In the future, obviously, most agencies will move to a digital uh, filing format. Um, what's happened is we've gotten a request to turn over all our records that are currently in our electronic document filing system, tens of thousands of records, as you might imagine, uh, in paper copy. All of them, um, because the individual does not want to use the electronic document filing system, and we've offered to help him, offered to set up a, a console, and um, he does not want to do that. There may be a lawsuit. We've refused refused to do it so far. There may be a lawsuit. We don't know, but in the meantime, we thought this is a problem that could be clarified rather easily by just uh, putting in this addition to 910, which basically mm -hmm. says. You know, if, if you have an electronic document filing system, people need to use that in order to see the documents. And that's all we're trying to do. Yeah. Anybody here? Uh, I would just be sensitive to the idea that 
while it's common to have a computer, not everybody does. And, and I wonder if what you would think about the idea, I think you sort of alluded to it, that providing a console. Yeah, yeah I'm fine with that. that if, you, if you can't get it from home, you could come to the agency. Yeah. Computer there. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have a, so you don't get booted out of the yeah. library. Yeah. 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 We have that already set up, but yeah, that would be fine if you wanted to put extra language on that. That'd be. That makes sense. Elena, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Oh. <laughs> but I will. <laughs> I just came in late. Yeah, I'm yeah, happy to talk to you. Yeah. We just decided to get going here, and it's the language the, language. the uh, public utilities. Yeah. And um, I guess I would ask for Helena, in the, except in the case, is this underlying what you're thinking of? Oh, yes. this is the actual copy. Yeah, that, that's yeah. it. Except in the case of a quasi judicial agency, uh, why would we? Yeah. yeah. You don't have agency. to limit it. Any yeah, you can say any. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. that's the, uh, clearly. We're just trying to limit it to us at this time, but yeah, it's fine. Except that if the agency maintains public records on, I would yep. just cross yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I mean, we all we already say that you don't have to if you don't have them in the format that the person wants, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. You don't have to create a new May, a new record or a new, right there. Yeah. So okay. So did you hear those little? Yes. Yeah, so um, the only <coughs> change to what he proposes would just be the agency it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be quasi. But also that we would monitor. Require some opportunity for people to come use a parallel or a, yeah. to view the okay. records electronically at the, the office. At the, at the office, just some Got kind it. of. I think there needs to be a, an access. Yeah, otherwise people will be kicked out of their local library because you only get 15 minutes okay. or some libraries. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Okay. We can get an hour ago. Thank you, folks. Well, you're special. Well, we know that. All right. Does anybody else in the room have any problems with that, just with that section? Yeah, as general counsel secretary of state's office, I think I would want to discuss that with secretary of state. It just it, 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 off the top of my head, I'm thinking, especially as expanded to all agencies, it could, it, it could really infringe on the ability of folks who don't have access or who, who for whatever reason, need to look at things on paper rather than on the screen, the ability to, to monitor what their, what their government teams are doing. Um, so I, I'm not saying that we're necessarily protesting, but I, I would want to talk it over with them. All right. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have issues with this section? Gwen? J just questioning, Gwen's active the LCT, just how this would apply because agency would also include all municipalities, large and small and different types, so just figuring out how this um, if they do have things in electronic form and how that would impact their, their records and their obligations with dealing with exemptions and those sorts of things. So I just need to run it by our attorneys as well. What if we just made it maybe fulfilled by allowing? I guess, yeah. Maybe fulfilled. Well, I mean, this is why we limited it to quasi-judicial, but. <laughs> right, no, no. But if we say may be fulfilled by allowing, so then somebody says, well, I, to you, says I want it in paper. You say, no, no, I'm fulfilling it. Yeah, that's fine. All right, I'll try. But the shall maybe starts to get to Jenny's point of, yeah. if it's maybe, but somebody's, I don't know. Right now, the, the person gets to choose paper if they wish in the statute, I believe that's so. Yeah. Okay. Our records aren't in paper right. at all, so. We don't even have. We'd have to. We'd have to hire someone to go through and print them all out. Um, that's the problem for us. We don't even have paper. If we wanted to turn it over. We, we we just don't have it anymore. And I wonder if somebody like Colchester, when we heard from Colchester in South Burlington, they're putting all of their records online. They would have the same problem if somebody came in and said, "Well, we want them all on paper." Yep. The town clerks. Brian? No, I'm just trying to thread the needle. I guess May does help somewhat for us. I agree. All right, so we will um, put that in as a suggested, in a suggested draft. And 
Helena, would you like to join us and go through the suggestions that have been given to us by the, just walk us through, or would you rather have the ACLU walk us through that? Or, I think um, it's up to you. We can sit together. Yeah, I think, um, I just want to make sure that there's been the talk on this last section about the shell to May, and I want to make sure everyone's on the same page about what you want to do. Can we just talk about that a little yeah. bit longer before we move on? I think May and cross off the quasi judicial. Yeah. And um, if they're going to require that, I mean, if they're going to do it electronically, they have to give some access right. at their office to be able to, yeah. to look at them. Yeah, I think the issue is just a little more complicated. So just in terms of the where where the lay of the land is now under the Public Records Act, um, a you know a person is entitled to a hard copy of an electronic document. And because I missed the beginning of the testimony, and I apologize, I don't know if the issue is that we have it sort of on the web and internally. They don't have hard copies. We have no, internally in Word or whatever they use and it is the issue that someone is demanding the hard copies because if this goes to May, then that won't solve yeah. the problem, right? Um, I, okay. If it says we may be fulfilled by allowing online public access, then I, I think that would solve the problem. But if they didn't want to fulfill it that way, it would have to Right. In our case, we would, we would always be, be, be fulfilled that way. But other agencies, maybe they don't want to do it that way. Sure. For us, we don't even have the paper. Like I was saying, we have to. I guess is what you're trying to get at is that does does the agency um, have the ability basically to to say <coughs> it's our choice to fulfill it that way, and we are telling you the requester, nope, you can't get a paper copy. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. And so by changing shall to may, all you're trying to say is that an agency that posts it online doesn't have to fill, fulfill it that way. That's right. right. That's but, your intent. But they, okay. may, they may do it in that, and by doing it that way, they fulfilled it, the okay. request. OK. If they do it. So I think that I want to work with the language okay. a little bit more Absolutely. to make it super clear that despite the fact that it says in current law, that the the part the, the requester is no matter what entitled to paper records, that this is an exception mm -hmm. to that. Yep, that's what we're trying to put in as an exception. Yeah. So I, I think the language, yeah, it's all I can work with them. Okay, great. And I do think that as we go more and more to electronic records, and I must admit I like paper, but if, if somebody comes in with a request, and somebody has requested of them all their electronic files. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, obviously we can print out, you know, a, a, a case, but tens of thousands of cases, that's a whole, we have to hire a, a company to do that at this point. It, it yeah. would be quite an undertaking. It's several thousands of dollars. We'd have to do an RFP. It, it, it's just an incredible burden on, on us, so. But one or two uh, cases, sure, we can still do that paper yeah. easily. Um, that's not a big deal. Are you okay? Yes. I am. Okay. All right. We'll leave it to Helena to work on the language to get us where we think we need to go. And Jenny, talk to the, your, your boss guy over there. Okay. All right. And did we decide that Chloe is going to walk us through this or Helena? I'm happy to do it, and then maybe Helena could speak if I mangle the uh, the uh, statutory uh, findings here. Um, for the record, I'm Chloe White, the ACLU of Vermont. So um, these are just a few language suggestions for improving Public Records Act. Um, I want to speak particularly the first one, um, and I've shown where. Uh, things in yellow are, and underlined are, are what would be changed. Um, I want to highlight first the no fees for inspection and a fee waiver for public interest and indigence. Um, right now, um, as you've heard, there, there is a court case um, that said that, so Superior Court, so not Supreme Court, said that 
under the law right now, there should be no fees for inspection. But some agencies still charge for inspection. Some, some municipalities still charge for inspection. Some don't. That's, that's, um, you know, it's, it's uneven. Um, if you are indigent in Vermont and you go to an agency that charges for inspection, there is no way you have unequal access to public records because there is no way for you to get to a record because we don't have a waiver for, for indigents. There are other states that have records that have waivers for both public interest. So this is in the public interest likely to contribute significantly to public understanding the operations or activities of the government it is not primarily in the commercial interest of the requester. That's, that's, from, that's from Federal Freedom of Information Act or the requester is indigent, and, and that can be defined as you know 100% of federal poverty level, 200% of federal poverty line. Um, so we'd like to see both these. We'd like to see no fees for inspection, and we'd like to see a fee waiver for public interest and indigents. But either way, right now, because of the inconsistent application of that court case, in some instances, people who are poor can't access public, rec public records because they'll get charged for inspection and there's no exemption uh, for indigents to get public records. So that's why we feel these are, these are both very important. Um, you know, this is, it provides a way. Inspection also, you're, it's kind of a give and take. You don't provide fees for inspection and then the person has to go to the agency, to the municipality to look at the thing. It's, it's uh, you know, both of you have to sacrifice something. Um, so the, this is where we would, this is, these are our, those are two big suggestions. Um, so regarding these sorts of fees here. Um, on the next page, we, in the next two pages, we talk about waivers of fees. Um, we think that after a denial of, um, so right now an agency head can reverse a denial by you know, that's your second step. After you get denied the first time by the agency, you appeal to agency head. We feel that after you've been, after that denial is, rever is reversed, that your fee should be waived. That any fees then should be waived. Now that, that might be, you know, that, that might not be palatable, I understand that. But I think even more importantly, is that after you win your court case, I think, we think that fees for obtaining records should be waived. You've won the court case, you had to go through court, um, but you're still getting charged for, for, for these records that you had to fight for. We, we, think, that, uh, we think that should be changed. Um, finally, these last two. Uh, I put them at the end uh, on purpose because I know that these are probably less palatable. Um, every other New England state for Public Records Act has penalties for willful or bad faith denials um, uh, and breaking the Public Records Act. Um, and they can range from $500 to $2,000. Uh, so this would bring, right now, Vermont just says, uh, if the court finds that the circumstances were surrounding the withholding raise questions about whether people acted appropriately, then they refer to DHR. This would bring us in line with other New England states. And so if in the court finds that an officer or employee or other official of a public body or public agency has violated any provision of the subchapter willfully or in bad faith, the court shall impose against such person a civil penalty of not less than $250 and not more than $2,000. Um, you know, this, this just brings us in line with every other state um, in New England that, that, has, uh, that has Public Records Act. Um, finally, this exemption review sunset uh, is from, this is from Florida. This is, they do this um, every five years. Um, the exemption shall be repealed unless there is a review and they, they, they act to, re, to reenact the exemption. So it is, the legislature must take affirmative steps to reenact an exemption and must review it to ensure that it is still timely, that it's still needed. Um, I realize that both of these are, uh, could prove, uh, 
they could prove a little harder to swallow than perhaps others, so that's why they're at the end. But we think these are important to ensure after any new exemptions that you know, right now an exemption could be justified. In five years, maybe the need is gone uh, for some re one reason or another. And perhaps it's not, but it gives us a reason to refresh our Public Records Act. So those are, those are our proposals. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I, you know, I know that we're getting to end of session. I know that this, these are, these are large, these are, you know, some of these are larger uh, steps than others, but, you know, we, we're ha we would love to see any improvement to the Public Records Act we can get. I, I like some of this, but I don't have questions. It is interesting that you thought, felt that the two last ones would be the hardest to digest in my mind. They're the easiest. No. Well, the, the last the, one's easiest. The last easiest. one is easy, and the other one is also that, for me, one of the questions is in, and I've always had this question, in, is in no, no fee for inspecting, which I understand there sh it should be. But sometimes the preparation to allow somebody to inspect takes hours and hours to redact. And um, so and um, in a, it, I'm thinking of in a town, for example, if you had a, if somebody wanted some records, you would first have to make a copy of the record. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to redact on the copy, because you couldn't redact it on the original thing. So it might take somebody 10 hours to, to do it. So I, that, in my mind, that's the more controversial. All right. Yeah, well, I understand that. Yeah, I mean, you copy paste in the document, you, you black it out, and you show it on the console are showing well, here. Well, if it's electronic. Right, if it's electronic. You know, and, and I understand that. And I know it's been a source of, uh, you know, much uh, much to do. And, and honestly, if you're not interested, I understand. But I would also add, I would also ask that you don't include any fees for inspections in, in the law. Leave it, leave it. Our, you know, our preference between those two would be leave it as is. Yeah. Um, you know, so. Any questions for Chloe? Okay. Thank you. I, I, I do have a, I'm sorry, a quick question. You, you said there was a court that said that there's not to be fees for inspection. Was that mm -hmm. a Vermont court? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, that was by Judge Crawford. Um, do you remember what year? 2011. 2011. Um, yeah, 2011. Uh, said that they should, there shouldn't be fees for inspection, which is why. So doesn't that sort of mean that fees for inspection are against the law, or was it not a, not a changing dynamic? For the record, Planet Gardner, um, a, a superior court decision is not binding, um, even within the same county. It's it's not um, binding. It, it would be a binding interpretation if it was Vermont Supreme okay. Court decision. Um, and then obviously, whatever you did as legislators on the topic would, would be the law of the land. That would be another way. OK. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, does anybody else have language that they want to offer before we then um, start looking at what we actually have? Yes. Uh, my name's Rama Schneider. I'm from Williamstown, Vermont, and I, I'll talk really quickly here. My interest here is, is with the, uh, the other portion of of 910, and that's of the open meeting definitions. Mm -hmm. um, I have two things. One of them has to do with the clarification as to whether or not negotiations actually fall under the open meeting law or not. And at this very moment, according to the Vermont Supreme Court, they don't through a rather what I consider twisted decision. Having said that, and the other part is, I, 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 I mean, I. I absolute advocate for open governance. I feel that it's very important for uh, uh, good governance. For my bona fides, I've been on the school board now for more than nine years. I've been on the Williamstown School Board, uh, now on the Payne Mountain School District School Board. I've been on the Orange North and the Central Vermont Supervisory Union Boards. I've been on one, two, three, four different negotiating committees, and, uh, I've, uh, and I chaired the, uh, the merger study committee that turned Williamstown and Northfield into the Payne Mountain School District, and I chaired the Williamstown School District and the Orange North Supervisory Union, as well as a couple of the uh, negotiating committees. 
So I, 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 I just, and, and plus I have a, a lot of personal interest in this, uh, that I have hounded the Secretary of State's office and attorneys and all about issues to do with the open meeting law. So I, I just say that in, in the sense, I, I'm not just, you know, I didn't just make up stuff. I, is This is issue that I have really, you know, felt important and I've studied it. Uh, the negotiations bit is, I, I'm not sure the clarification, I, there's a proposed new language in there as far as uh, how to define the open meeting law. And actually, if I may go to my phone here, and uh, which one is it? So, so in, in the proposal, where it says uh, definitions in one, business of the public body means the public body's governmental functions, including any matter over which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. Does that mean negotiations with our staff or not? When I read it, it says yes. I don't know how they get, well, no, I know how they get around to it, but between the Vermont Labor Relations Board and the Vermont Supreme Court, apparently, Negotiations fall under a, a totally different set of rules. Strictly the staff negotiations. So, as a negotiating committee from the uh, from the, uh, the Central Vermont Supervisory Union Negotiating Council point of view, we're still a public body. But when we go to negotiate, we can't go as a public body into the negotiations because they're not there. It's the Supreme Court has said that's not part of an open meeting. It doesn't fall under the open meeting law. And they, they it was either in February, I, I believe it was in the middle of February they came out with the decision. I'd have to go back and look for the exact date. There's there's two uh, decisions that came out side by side that they decided on that one. Um, th this leads to the rather foolish concept that we show up for negotiations, I have to call a meeting to order, and then we recess the meeting to go have negotiations, come back, and it, it's all about school board business. Every bit of negotiations is about discussing and making decisions on school board business. So I, I, I just I personally, not personally, I know I'm not the only one, but I am looking, I, I would like to see some clarification, something that states specifically staff negotiations are or are not a part of an open meeting. I, 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 I don't know the court cases, but I think the law is pretty clear. It says that you, you go into executive session for contracts, labor relations agreements with employees, or arbitration or mediation. That's, you go into executive session. That means it's not open. Well, the, the, first off, they said that it doesn't, because if we go into executive session, that means we're meeting under the open meeting law. And listen, I'm not the Supreme Court. I didn't make The Supreme Court said that? Yep. Yes. The, but they're meeting. But do you, well, you, but you go in, you have to. We recess. Meet. We don't you go. meet, then you we go into executive session, no. and then you come out of executive no. session. No. We, we, no. we have to recess right now to actually leave the meeting to but do you, the negotiations. You should have a motion to enter executive session. Yeah. No, we For can't. We Why can't? can't? Because it's well. not part of the open meeting law, and if, we, if I do that, the, uh, the staff contract negotiating team is going to go for an unfair labor practices suit against us, period. That's just, take that as fact. Well, they, the Supreme Court really doesn't know what they're talking about. That's why I'm asking for the, if they say, and now if you, when you get to the, if you go back and look at the Supreme Court this decision, the I don't know which one you're looking at. Um, it's called Negotiations Committee. It's um, no. of Caledonia Central Supervisor. Yeah that's, no, that's yeah, that's the one that made the decision, and then they tacked on a second one on that and said, well, we don't have to decide this because when we decided the other one. Uh, February 23rd. Of this year? Of this year. Yes. Okay. Well. Okay. So. All right. So I, we get that. You need okay. To Thank you. And, and just for further clarification, we don't have to go into executive session. No, the board know. needs to find a purpose, and we need to decide on a, a right, vote. Right. right. Okay. That, that's, so that's the first. I, I just really, you know, frankly, I would prefer if you kept negotiations part of the open meeting law. But if you, if you do or don't, 
they, they, even with the new language that's being proposed here, if that got through, I would be suggesting to my district that we go back through a court case again to test this because it would have to come out with a whole new interpretation because the wording gets changed on what's an open, what is the business of the board. The, uh, the other part is has to do with, uh, I believe it's item number four on the open meeting. It's about if, uh, if a uh, quorum of a board attends another public bodies warned meeting that they don't have to also issue a warning. Although the, the bit about the, um, uh, if you just get together for social events, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, but when we go to, as, as a board member, as a board, if you go as a quorum to another body, you're usually going there to conduct some sort of business, either to listen and possibly to discuss and, and exchange ideas with another board. I think, and there's nothing wrong with putting out a warning. Anybody can type up a warning 48 hours ahead of doing something. And in this case, a warning just simply says, we'll be at a such and such meeting, such and such place. What, what if a select board didn't give you that much warrant. Well, I guess they have to warn. I just wonder if there's. I mean, you're. It, it would be if you're invited to testify at a select board, for instance, you'd be on their public meeting notice, right? If you go as an individual. Right. Person. Well, I mean, if it just said like well, we want to hear from the school board, so it'd be a, an agenda item that they notice. Listen, we're not going to get to a perfect situation on all of this, so it's always a matter. And, and you mentioned timing, which is an important one. We have 24 hours notice to give on a, uh, for uh, a special meeting, which really isn't anything special. It's just something outside of the normal scheduling. So if it were to come up like that within 24 hours, I personally do not feel it would fall under the definition of an emergency meeting, but by the letter of the law saying, well, we got to be there tonight, would be an emergency meeting. I, that's, that's by the letter of the law. So I, I, I think that can be approached, but I just think that it should have to be warned, if you, even if you're going to another warned meeting, because I, I, you know, my assumption is you're going there as a group for a purpose. And the only purpose behind a going as a, as a quorum as a, of a board is something about the business of that board. Thank you. That's that's all I have to. Thank you. Well, I need to hear from Helena or Jenny or somebody about this Supreme Court case because yeah. I didn't know that, and it sounds ridiculous that it very clearly says that they go in, they may go into executive. I read the decision when it came out February twenty third. If possible, I'd like time to. It's a you know, it's a long opinion, it's complicated, I want to digest it and give you a good work product okay. instead of trying to remember off the cuff exactly all its pieces of analyses. I know it's holding, but I forget all the nuances of how they got there. Yeah, I just, uh, law seems pretty clear to me, but, okay. I, I can tell you it was subject prior to the Vermont Supreme Court decision to Vermont Labor Relations Board decision and um, that there, the reason it made it through <laughs> this far to the Vermont Supreme Court, it, there's some strong feelings on the issue, I think, on, on both sides, it's fair to say. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, now let's just look at the bill, the whole bill, and see where we are. So, uh, Madam Chair, if the committee is going to consider the amendments by ACLU, uh, yeah, well, my office we're, would like we're to We're consider considering everything right now. Then we have some comments okay. in opposition to w those. Would you be happy to? Yeah, because we, just to make it clear to everybody that we're hearing this today, it's Friday. We have this on the schedule for um, next week on. Um, I, ha I do have it here someplace. I don't know what I've done with it, but I do know I have it here someplace. There it is. Um, next week we have this on the schedule for um, Tuesday. I mean, Wednesday. Uh, what is this number? 9, 10? Yes. Oh, no, I guess we were hoping we might. Do it in today. 
But if we don't get it out next week, then nothing happens. Because once we get it out, it has to go back to the house. Mm -hmm. And they have to decide what they want to do with it. And um, that was said for Rob's benefit. And then um, whether there's a conference committee or whatever, so we need to allow time for that. So. Okay. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Joshua Diamond, Deputy Attorney General. Um, I'd like to start by giving some factual context to why we oppose, not all, but many of the uh, proposals by ACLU. And I think, uh, Madam Chair, you kind of touched on some of this, which is the practical reality of how an agency, is, in particular uh, the one that I work for, uh, has to deal with these public records requests. I think there was an inference uh, made at the last hearing or two hearings ago on this bill that these very broad public records requests are um, the exception, not the rule. And I'm not saying everyone is. Often we can respond to a request within the 30 minutes that's contemplated by the statute. Somebody wants a, a contract or uh, some other readily available information, a, a budget document from our office, we can produce that. But often the request can be broad, and I want to just give some examples to illustrate that point. And these are all examples that have happened within the last year and a quarter since I've come to the Attorney General's office. Uh, there was a request from an entity for all communications from nine Assistant Attorneys General to 30 miscellaneous organizations and individuals, including various public officials, such as Senator Sanders, various lobbyists, organizations such as the Democratic Attorneys General's. Uh, association. In order to even just identify what documents would have been responsive to that request, my office had to hire an IT professional to uh, survey all of the various emails and other records. The initial uh, search indicated uh, over 13,500 responsive emails given the breadth of that request. Now when you were able to take away the duplicates, you know, people who had been CC'd, there were still um, 1,129 email chains that had to be produced responsive to that request. And then, because we're a law firm, um, as, as many you can appreciate if you've ever done work with law firms, we have an obligation to keep our communications confidential if they involve an attorney-client communication or if it represents work product on an ongoing case. Uh, there are uh, recognized um, privileges that have to be uh, addressed and it took over 250 hours of staff time to go through those documents to assess what were the appropriate documents that could be produced or redacted. And so if um, the mere inspection was a loophole, if you will, to the ability to charge for that time, instead of doing the public's work, the state's work of uh, defending the state uh, or to pursue uh, those who would harm our environment or uh, protecting consumers or protecting the civil rights of Vermonters. We're taking attorney time away from those core functions to address the public records request. Um, another example that we received within the last year was a request for all records pertaining to the investigation of a particular defendant that was part of a, a criminal prosecution. And in this case, this involved um, claims of tax evasion. So there were literally thousands of canceled checks uh, bank records, not just from this person, but from other people, where someone had to go through, identify what those records were, and had we had to produce those, we would have had to go through and do that redaction process. And again, it would have been a, a very time-consuming process. Um, other types of uh, similar requests was uh, one with which uh, a request for the entire investigative file of a woman who is part of a cold case, someone who has presumably been killed, uh, but we, we don't know that for certain. Um, and that request had 15 bankers' boxes of records that had to be inventoried just to provide an estimate of what the charge would be to, um, to tell someone, if you want us to produce these records and figure out what's privileged or not, it took an attorney 25 hours to do that. So I, I say that within the context of the request that that there shouldn't be a charge for figuring out what documents may be responsive. 
and certainly for no for someone who wants to inspect as opposed to get a copy that there should be a, a pass and we we assert respectfully one that the case law uh, that's referenced in the trial court decision may not reflect the current status of the law from the Supreme Court's perspective um, but two um, from a pragmatic concern um, while we, we firmly believe that open government is essential to a functioning democracy and public records are an important part, there's got to be a balance. And the balance, where does that fall? Should it be on the taxpayer? Because if you can imagine, it wouldn't take much for a requester really to shut down an agency by using broad requests uh, and, and force folks to uh, take away from their core mission and deal with these requests. So I would respectfully ask that this committee not uh, change the current status of the law as it pertains to uh, inspection and fee waivers. Now, with regards to those who may be indigent and those who uh, there may be a public interest, I think agencies already have that discretion uh, to do so. And even though I think the law allows for uh, the ability to charge after 30 minutes of time, uh, our office frequently does not do that and, and provides additional time uh, without charge uh, as when the interests are, are so justified. Um, with regards to the request for penalties, uh, I have not done the research as to what the fellow uh, New England states do. Uh, it does seem to me that typically uh, when a penalty is assessed, that's the state acting in a way to enforce the laws the penalty comes back to the general fund as a, as a mechanism of enforcement. This would depart from that standard practice by giving members of the public the ability to assess the penalty against the state. Um, and the question, I think, for such a departure, is there a compelling need? I would uh, assert anecdotally that the robust attorney's fees that are available for folks, the shall, the change from may to shall, creates quite an incentive for public agencies to comport with the um, public records laws. I think ACLU testified a couple of hearings ago about a, a $30,000 attorney's fees bill uh, associated with their challenge uh, over some public records held by the agency of ed. So I think uh, agencies are very sensitive. I think towns are very sensitive and are trying to do the right thing because the, frankly, the threat of attorney's fees is a pretty heavy hammer that they've got to deal with from a financial liability perspective. Um, with regards to the sunset, uh, it's an interesting policy question, and uh, my office does not have an opinion on that issue. So if somebody is, I mean, it is a deterrent, I'm sure, the fact that they're going to have to pay attorney's fees. But if somebody really acted in bad faith, shouldn't there be some penalty for them? or at least a ding on their personnel record or a, I mean, because they're, they're, that person is affecting not only the, the, is impeding the ability to get the records, they're also then, if they acted in bad faith and it ended up in a court hearing, the $30,000 that you had to pay, what is taxpayer money that's coming out of because they acted in bad faith. There's, I mean, I, I think you get at the same place, respectfully. Um, the person themselves doesn't. Well, I'm not. I haven't seen the particular language. I don't know if they're making the person individually liable for that penalty. It says officer, employee, or other official. And so the question is whether acting in one's official capacity, if it's not a malicious intentional act, if it's willful, then there's a distinction between those terms. One could argue it may fall back to the employer to be responsible for that fee at the end of the day. I, further research would be needed to kind of nail that down. Um, I just want to let you know about a provision in existing law, and that, okay. um, I don't know if, based on what you said, you might want to look at it or tweak it. Um, it's. Um, I think I should provide this to you. This is my little copy of the whole Public Records Act. So just from start to finish, I can get you guys a copy of that. But the existing law says, whenever the court orders the production of any public agency records improperly withheld from the complainant and assesses against the agency reasonable attorney's fees and other litigation costs. So when the public agency right. is lost, 
Okay. And it says, goes on to say, and the court additionally issues a written finding that the circumstances surrounding the withholding raise questions whether the agency personnel acted arbitrarily or capriciously with respect to the withholding. The Department of Human Resources, if applicable to that employee, shall promptly initiate a proceeding to determine whether disciplinary action is warranted against the officer employee who is primarily. So you see there's some contingencies yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. You've lost, attorney's fees have been assessed, yeah. the court makes a finding and has a, then, you know, so there's some gates along the way <laughs> before you get there, but there's, um, and then it goes on to say, Department being Human Resources, after investigation consideration of the evidence submitted, shall submit its finding and recommendations to the administrative authority. Um, shall take the corrective action that the department recommends. So, and that what you've done is what ACLU has done is crossed all that off and just said says that if the court finds, then they are fined. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And then one last small minute item. I know a subsection H of the current bill. Uh, our office is um, in spirit on the same page about having a designated person being responsible so that members of the public know where to go to. We would just ask that the reference to, and I don't have it in front of me, I think it's 3 VSA 218, 218 that, that be stricken so that we have the flexibility to have different people. Someone who's going to be in, in charge of uh, records management may be different from the person who um, would be responsible for your office has made that recommendation but this says shall be accountable for the request so it's hard for me to imagine why this is a problem like if they're not it doesn't say they have to go and make the photocopies they just have to be basically the point person yeah and and we're fine with that and understand that but the person who does um, we, we would like the the flexibility to have someone who's responsible for records management be different than the person who would be ultimately responsible for the production of records responsive to a public records request. But would there be a person in the AG's office? Because when you talked about it before, you talked about that there are 18 different places that we need to have, there needs to be one person who is accountable so that people know where to go to hold that person accountable. I, I think we can live within that rubric. Or construct. You just don't want to insist that it's the the same person. The same person. I feel strongly about that. It makes sense to me that the person who who the person who does the records management is also accountable for the records requests, but. Thank you for your time and consideration. <coughs> All right. Where are we here? It's just like every other every other state has it. The agency has a name and the agency is a Okay. Where are we? I guess we have to figure out this Supreme Court. Yeah. Except for the things that are, fall under the executive, this is, this is just um, or except for reference to whatever. Except happens. for yeah, referring to the Maybe. the executive meeting law, um, the ability. I I don't know. Yeah, I was surprised to hear that. I've always thought personnel matters should just go into executive. It session. says yeah. clearly. Yeah. I, I don't get where they're. Well, we have you know? the benefit of. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but the, uh, the decision, again, I don't want to yeah. go that much into a 20-page decision that's complicated. It has, if I remember correctly, multiple, um, uh, looks how the, the law relates to other laws. Um, uh, so they looked at a variety of statutes, and they were looking specifically at school board negotiations, right, with the collective bargaining, so a group of, what, three on each side. And the holding was that 
that group of six uh, was not a meeting of a public body. It, it didn't fall within the definition of, of meeting. But there was multiple elements of analysis. So I can write you a summary or come back in when I just think yeah. it's fresher and free read. <laughs> All right. So that's one issue that we have to deal with. Yeah. Then there is the, um, on page 2D, um, the, whether if you're going to a, if a quorum of a public body is going to a meeting of another public body, should they also warn that they're going to be there? That's the issue, right? And then, um, and then we have the issue of serial communications to address. Um, are there more in here that Do we all agree that crossing means promptly with, uh, and, but it can extend to three days? Promptly can extend to three days. No, I didn't agree with that. So you want to You want to change it? Change it on page five? I don't know what I would change it to. But promptly doesn't sound like three days. Well, it means immediately, but, yeah. but not be. more than. You can have three days to respond. Yeah. Okay. And then we have the, um, the issue that uh, the AG's office brought up about um, who's that? Who's accountable? Mm -hmm. I still, when I read that, I don't, I don't think it means maybe what. Deputy Attorney General thought. I, I can still see that one person would be the go-to person in that agency or wherever. That doesn't mean that person actually has to do the work. It just means they're, re they're responsible for making the work gets done. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I, mean, I, I, I don't disagree with that interpretation. I'm just thinking about it, it, maybe a picture could speak a thousand words. If you've got um, you know, three people doing the actual public record search, mm -hmm. but you got one person who's ultimately yeah. responsible. We're okay with that, I, yeah. that concept, yeah. but it's this person who we'd like to have some flexibility being different from the person who's responsible for records management. That, that's all. So that we have the flexibility to say, the person who's gonna be ultimately responsible for public records requests doesn't necessarily have to be the same person who's the chief liaison with archives and dealing with uh, records retention issues and figuring out what are significant documents that would be archived and it wouldn't be destroyed after a difficult time period. Okay. 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 Some of the ACLU ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the PUC language. Yeah. All right. Are there any of them that we can solve, that we can resolve today? Let's look at the last one here, the AG request. Helena, do you want to join us? Sure. Then. Is there a way of resolving that that allows them to have a little more flexibility? Um, I, I think the, um, you know, I'm a little, if, if you want to go along with the idea, I'm a little concerned that if it still says a records officer, um, that itself could cause confusing. That's a, the term used in, in Title III. And so if you want to just give the flexibility and the, the idea that it be a central point person, I would suggest striking records officer designated by head of state agency pursuant to striking all that just and just say a person uh, designated by the head of the state agency or department. So right, strike, sorry, strike records officer and strike pursuant to 3 VSA 318, assuming you want to go and just say 
um, person designated by the agency. Yeah, or, 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 yeah. or it, the agency shall, shall designate a person. Yeah, yeah. The onus is on the agency. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, Get rid of the passive voice. The head of a state yeah. agent shall designate yeah. okay. a person <laughs> to be oh. accountable for the oversight of, and you had suggested for the oversight of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of the processing. Does that sound okay? Yes. All right. Thank you for your consideration. Yeah. Okay, done. One, down. Nice. All right, super. All right. I like the sunsetting idea. I, I don't mind that. I mean, um, I mean, we are sunsetting records, I mean, reports now. Yeah. And we probably might get to the point where we're sunsetting commissions. Um, we sunset lots of things, and it just means you have to go back and, and review them. Yeah. I mean, just for new ones. It's just, yeah, we're not talking about all those old Not ones. the existing 250. <laughs> we might get to that point at some point to say maybe they should all be sunset. And they might, but no, we all. We don't want to spend another three years doing that. Uh -huh. Lord. Okay. Uh, uh, any, does anybody have any comments on that? Dr. Guy? No. Claire? No. I have a, just a yes. clarifying question. Um, so the list in Title I um, is all exemptions in the Vermont statutes annotated. Sometimes um, an exemption, there's rulemaking authority that includes uh, creating a, an exemption and uh, like fleshing out the contours of an exemption in rule. Would you want that to be um, subject to the five year look back um, or just ones in statute? Just for simplicity, I think it's statute. Start with the ones in the statute and yeah. then at some point. Yeah. And, um, you know, but this happens with reports and then laws enacted that says notwithstanding the five year automatic. But I was wondering if you thought there might be, should be potentially an exception if um, the exemption just tracks what's in federal law. Um, sometimes that's why an exemption is is created. Um, oh, I guess we can't we can't sunset. Can't do that. I mean, you could we you could, could still look at it and say, yep, the federal law is still there, you know, right. so, you know. Right. But um, I wouldn't make just, an exception for that okay. because federal just law may change. Still there. We still have. Right. Yeah. Right. If it started out exempted for that reason. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I uh, wanted to, uh, I, th I think that just as a heads up, the only way to properly keep track of this would be that every bill that creates an exemption would, the section after it was created would have another section that repealed it and then that next section that repealed it would take effect in five years time in terms of our statute books, that would probably be the only way we could really. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm starting to think about the mechanics of this from a codification yeah. perspective. Right. We have um, full yeah. faith in your thinking. <laughs> no, um, um, yeah. I, I want to, I'll check in with my colleagues on this too, yeah, because it's yeah. just a whole co codification. But conceptually, sure. we don't. Disagree with it. Yeah. So for every exemption created, there would be a following or subsequent section that would repeal it within five years. Mm -hmm. That would repeal it, and the repealing section would have a delayed effective date of five years. That would be the sunset. And that would be so one of the reasons I suggested is that, you know, if that's how you keep track of, you know, part of how everyone keeps track of what's going on in the statute, and also if there's a subsequent amendment to it that's more technical. Sorry, I'm getting into logistical issues, but. Okay, but if it can be done yeah. without. Yeah, it can. Making be. everybody crazy. Okay. So. Talk. 
think it has been a long one. We also had the idea of something around no issues of substance shall be discussed. Oh. Where are you? Well, yeah. that was, uh, I think that was Donnie. Here, but it was something about under what what is not meant, you know, under yeah. emails yeah. around agendas and stuff. It was tricky because the construction is all in the negative. But. So, um, you asked me to um, work with Mike. Um, I sent him some language last Friday saying, you know, is this what you're trying to get at? He um, wanted to be here today, but he had, uh, he couldn't, and he said he's available next week. Um, and so what I had sent to him was, um, it would be in um, page one. Um, so 3A says what a meeting is. This is generally, this is what a meeting is. And then B is that um, safe harbor exception, however you want to characterize it, for scheduling a meeting, organizing an agenda, or distributing ma materials. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the fear was, OK, while you're at it doing those things, I w he wants an affirmative statement. This is not a license to stray into more substantive topics. So I had said, suggested to him where it says provided that, mm -hmm. put a colon, and then create two provisos, a subdivision one and two, provided that no other business of the, of the public body is discussed or no substantive business. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he thought, oh, that's going in the right direction, but I want something even more explicit. No other business is discussed, comma, including, and then examples. Um, and so he was going to work on some language to send to you, but it's not final yet. That seems like an artful way to address it. Mm -hmm. And then the other subdivision that. would be the rest of what falls, and then provided that subdivision in the language of existing law. Yeah, I like your solution. Yeah. We'll see what he comes up with. If we want to be short or long. Okay. Yeah. So. The only problem I ever see with is starting to make a list which starts with the word including is. Mm -hmm. It's not on that list. It's not included. No, that's not. No, true. but it's it's not exhaustive. Yeah, no, it always means, but not limited. Yeah. yeah. But once you. Which is why we don't need it. Right, exactly. Yeah, but, yeah, right. Un unless the. Yeah, I would not be in favor of that. I'm not sure that if you start saying including, then. <coughs> and that's what people read. Right. Oh, but we didn't talk about that. We talked about this other thing. Fine. So, Maybe the simple statement provided that right. no other substantive. I think that's yeah. what we want yeah. to say. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually think that's good enough. Okay. Can we talk about D on page two? D or C? Oh. Oh, yeah. or C. No. oh, I see. I'm sorry. D. You're right. You're right. Yeah. pretty clear as long as the public body does not take action on its business. Yeah. I mean, if you're if the select board goes to meet with the school board about parking lot, parking lot and who's going to pay for the parking lot and who's going to maintain it, if it's the school board meeting and the select board attends it, three people happen to go, but you don't take any action, you just, it's already warned as a public meeting by the school board with that on the agenda that says we're going to talk with the select board about the parking lot and you don't take any action. I mean the school board might take action but the select board can't take action until they have a warm meeting. Well and, and if you do warn it they could take action which kind of would concern me. They could take action at that meeting if you both warn it yeah. And, and if 
I mean, the t time that makes me think of it is on the Parks and Rec Commission. Sometimes city council would have us there, and the chair would typically go, and sometimes a few of us would also go. You know, and so if two of us went to support the chair, yeah. you could they were getting questions from the council, and maybe we would weigh in. It's not, uh, to me, it is about do you make decisions or not. Yeah. Did you want to? Yeah, I, the open meeting law defines an open uh, uh, a public body, an open meeting of the public body as being discussion of the business of the public body, mm -hmm. too, not just action. And I, I do remember when this was over in the House and I gave some testimony about a couple of other items that were related to this over in the House, and one of the issues that I believe a gentleman from the newspaper was bringing up was the fact that people get cheated out of the discussion behind the decisions if we allow the discussion and action to be kind of separated. And I know this can be kind of frustrating for people, like for instance, when you see a school board or a select board go into an executive session improperly, then they come back later and they just reaffirm the decision. And if people are warned at that time to go to that meeting, they never hear the discussion that went into the decision. So that, that's, I think, part of why there was some concern about that. I, and I get that. But I think that if the school board warns a meeting, and on their warning they say, we're going to discuss with the select board the parking lot. Rob, Representative McClellan. I've had that exact scenario where I was at, on a select board and we went to the school board to talk about buses, whether we were going to do, uh, continue doing the maintenance or not. But it was, we had the discussion, the school board made their decision as to how they wanted to deal with it. And we went back in the following select board yeah. meeting is when we had the discussion and made um, yeah. an action motion. But people knew that the select board was going to be there with the school board right, talking about school buses. we were buses. on the school board's agenda. Yeah. Yes. Did yeah. both bodies warn? Um, I, I don't believe we did, um, because our intent was it was just to, to listen and not take any action. Okay. And and to be honest, I'm not sure if we knew we were going to have a quorum. No, yes, we did. We did. But I think I think that we felt that because we were on the school board's agenda, that the warning language had been met. I have to feel okay with this language. Me too. Okay. Um, so now, really, the um, two issues, uh, or the PUC language, the um, charging for inspection, changing that, and the, um, I mean, the suggestion here for yep. the ACLU, and and serial communications. We have not. And that does not mean the Cheerios talking to the Wheaties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if um, everybody got the email from the Secretary of State's office that I forwarded about whether I asked whether this had more clout yes. if it was here rather than in just the current law as interpreted by the Secretary of State. Which piece, which particular piece? Uh, it's it's page three, three, section three. two. Section two. That's the serial communications yeah. one. So I asked him if if it, because the way he interprets the law now is that this is illegal. And he said it does have more clout because it has the backing of statute instead of just his interpretation of what he thought we meant. And, and then sent a, an article had been in the Times Argus that very morning about um, decisions being made in that manner. So. so as I recall, Senator Pearson brought up a good example of mm -hmm. a roadblock 
if you will, with uh, city council, how many members are 12, 13, whatever it is, and one of the members wants to introduce an amendment but needs to kind of get a feel for how much support, I'm maybe not saying it. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way to become aware of how much support that person might have would be to talk to people or at least show them before the other meeting. And I don't know how you get around that. Certainly that would fly in the face of well, I, it, it, it would if you got, if you had 12 members, if you got to the seventh member. It wouldn't if you got to the sixth member. That's the, it's, it's avoiding a, <laughs> it's but a, thou shalt not try to win your That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's avoiding a quorum Here's by a doing that. Bit, and, um, and it is, I, I mean, you probably shouldn't be doing it now. I don't know how you guys operate, but yeah, I, we shouldn't be doing it in my select board by going to everybody and saying, I want you to support me on this. Will you support me? And then we don't have to talk about it. And we'll just I mean, buy it's, the it's red so truck. Can't sort of put some intent Because it stinks, like that article, you know, the practice of that is different, uh, of, you know, pre-deciding as opposed to gaining support for an idea, you know, is different in my mind. And the mm -hmm. public is cheated when the body just comes out and says, I'll take a motion now to buy the red truck. So what about, you know, for example, what if delegation from Addison and we were three or four, we all decided we we're going to oppose any bill that uh, does something. How is that? That's not. Right. That is. We would just vote. Yes well, or you no. decided, you better have decided in the open. That's the point. You can't. You, you're not supposed to decide. Yeah. Well, it does say reach agreement or take action. And it seems to me, you know, we do that all the time in a lot of ways. You know, they're. You have a the delegation might have a, a position on a certain issue that's really important, like water or nuclear power or whatever it is, and um, we decide we're going to stick together on a certain issue to leverage something. Mm -hmm. How can it work if we we can't have a discussion with each other at a meeting? You know, thirty people. Right. You. Well, we could, because we could go into a committee of the whole, and then you could, then you have that discussion. It's different than being on the floor. You could go into the committee of the whole and have the discussion and take testimony and do it that way. That's, um, but the, I, I have well, a- even running for election, if you run, if you wanted to be the secretary of an organization, you go and you talk to people, you vote for me. Well, that's a, well, but you, that's you different. Well, but that's but, to come to a conclusion. A no, you're not coming to a. Conclusion. What about if you're trying to run for the head of the select board? Yeah. Well, yeah. A anything like that. Are we really going to pretend that nobody tries to get the votes of a majority to become the in Burlington the president of the council? And what what is it in Putney? You can become the chair of the select board. We, we yeah, rotate. So I hope the meeting goes well. We rotate it every yeah, third year. So <laughs> people get together and say, yeah. the fifth one's no, going to no, be the yeah. chair. <laughs> Are you what? kidding? No one else showed up at the meeting. You're the chair. At the That's, organizational So meeting. you are running. You actually want to be chair. Let's say one wants to be chair. You can make sure that <laughs> if it's a five member board, you could talk to one other person. That, come on. I mean, that is what well, we're saying. That crazy. I don't think that running for the board that is, is clearly I was the business no. of a public body. Yeah, I was going to question that too. To me, it's a different decision than if you <clears throat> allocate fifty thousand dollars to buy something. Yeah, that's that's the business, business of the body for sure. Running for itself and, is, and I know it's splitting hairs, and I agree because it it does have an effect on the body. Who's the chair or head of it? Yeah. 
but I agree with you too. I don't know how else you would be able to campaign. So when we talked to one other person, it was a five member board. And you couldn't ask that person to talk to somebody else, right? Well, I'm agreeing with that. Yeah, no. I I, I mean, I just wonder if it's more, if it's more productive to say that the public has a right to understand the rationale for the, for the decisions that are made. I don't think so. I, because yeah. you, you could go to the meeting and you sit down and say, well, we all got together and we, or we individually all went to look at the red truck or the blue truck, but um, I, I really liked the blue truck better, and so I encouraged the guy at the sales department to uh, come up with a rationale for buying the blue truck, and so now we're buying the blue truck. I mean, what are you gonna say when you go to a public meeting to explain your rationale for how you made your decision? Well, we, we do it all the time. Every time we're on the floor, we're debating something. We all basically know how we're going to vote and debate. But it's a public dialogue where you hopefully hammer out the issues. Mouse. You, you present the issues, I think. Generally, I'm not aware of it often changing votes. It doesn't. I don't and think so. This is the quandary. It, it is is a quandary. The public has a right to expect to understand the deliberation. Yep. And if there is but no if deliberation. If you're an elected official, you have the right to organize for your position to prevail. I mean, you can't neuter somebody because they get elected. But so how do you get around the fact that, so, and this is particularly true with select boards and school boards, and I've seen it happen over and over and over, they come in and they make a decision without any, any real substantive dialogue because, or it's so choreographed that you know exactly that they've talked about this before and they know exactly what they're gonna do and there's no real public dialogue and no, how, how do you avoid that? I think that's what he's trying to do authority. here. Huh? You have the ultimate authority. Yeah, a year later two years later, three years later in our case. In the, I mean, in the, our Putney Select Board case. But that doesn't, that doesn't, I mean, so the public, they can keep making those kinds of decisions for the next year and a half until the next election, and then you Usually kick out one of them, year. huh? And then you kick out one of them, and then they, the two might get the message. <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough to get people to even run, much less. <laughs> much less insist that they not talk to each other. <laughs> or tell them that we're going to vote you out if you do talk to each other. I mean, well, we all know I the bad know. behavior that this is trying to address. Yes. The question is how do we that it eliminates a lot of the work that gets done in every kind of committee there is. The question is, should that work be being done outside of the public meeting? That's the question. And what kind of work should be being done outside the public meeting, and what should it be? So how would this work? If you sit on a board with, let's say, 10 people, and the interest or the issue is whether or not to buy the red truck or the blue truck, that body could ad hoc decide to create a committee of three or four people to go look at the options available. Not a quorum level. Oops, that committee is a public body. Well, but if it's authorized in the public body to go do some work, that's fine. Yeah. Right? Or even yeah, to include yeah, a member of the public. Body. And they'd go down and they'd run numbers and then they would come back and make a report. And then everybody yeah. gets a shot at hearing it. Yeah. To me, that, that works okay, but I don't know whether that fits here. I would guess, under that scenario, that if a committee is going somewhere, a committee that is either one event, or if it's a three-person subcommittee and two of them go, they're in violation 
of this if it's not worn on there again. But that isn't any different now than it is here. This this is not any subcommittee is a, considered a public body, I believe, and is subject to all of the, the all of the same things. So. Um, Could I ask Representative Leclerc if they must have talked about this? Ten hours. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> we don't want to beat that record. First of all, <laughs> we're almost there. <laughs> Uh, Rob Clear, Barry Tavern. Yes, we talked about this a lot, and, but we were talking about it a bit in the other direction. If you have like a three member select board, mm -hmm. what ends up happening? And what ends up happening, quite honestly, in, in the real world? You know, you're running each other in a little local store, and, you know, you're, you know, that you're going to buy a new town grader, and say the discussions around if you want to buy an extended warranty. Um, mm -hmm. This, this was a challenge for us as well. I know. But that's why we did great work and kicked it over here. <laughs> oh, man. Well, let's come back to this. Let's see if we can get everything but this. Okay. Okay. Good. But this is the best one. This is this this is the one that's gonna cause the most angst of anything that we do. I don't do. see how it can work. Hmm? I don't see how it can work. I can see what we don't want, but I don't see how this language can work. And I wonder oh, are you ready to go? <laughs> Certainly. Should we just find it? <laughs> I need to go to this. Well, we have to do the Barry Town Charter first, which is okay. going to take us about an hour and a half, isn't it? Well, first it's, it's Barry City. Oh, it's Barry City. And I am Barry Town, and we can make this really short. <laughs> yeah, we will. But we, first, I want, so those are the issues that we have left to decide on this. So the, the, um, in terms of the ACLU list of issues, I, I think that you want to see in the next draft the um, sun exempt, new exemptions, substantially amended exemptions that that? Set after five years. Yeah, how, how that work? Well, then yeah. you, hadn't, um, you hadn't decided on the other ones? Uh, well, I, 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 I don't look at the second to last one. Have, had we decided on that? I, I think that leaving the language the way it is. So that's a no. Which one? The second to penalties. last one, the one on the penalties. Yeah. The leaving, because there is a penalty in there, and when Helena read it, it made sense. So, not accepting that proposal. Right. And then on the charging for fees, I, I could see some kind of a, a waiver for indigent, but do, I'm not sure at this point that we are ready to change the other fee one. I mean, the court has made the decision, and it'll come up again in another case sometime. But but I could see having a, a waiver for. Yeah. So um, there. So on the, the top one about not charging for inspection. That's how that proposal is. I don't think we have time to really vet that. Right, the so way we should. Fix that up for now. And then um, this says shall or may waive. Um, as mm -hmm. Judge Diamond pointed out, they already may. Nothing requires them to charge right now. Mm -hmm. So they already have the authority to waive. Um, then there's sorry, two grounds provided yeah. here. So this is only really meaningful if it says, or only really changes the law if it says shall. Um, and so, um, yeah, then uh, I would make it a May. So then that means not changing it. Yeah. That's current law? They well, may right now. Well, my point is that current law says an agency may charge, okay. meaning that they don't have to charge, which means yeah. as long as it's not discriminatory or arbitrary um, in how they charge or don't charge, right. they mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. may. Indigent, I mean, is that a defined term in some sense? I think you said 200% of poverty. Is that how? Uh, there's indigent. multiple definitions all yeah. throughout the VSA that tries to get at that issue. 
Um, but if if you, unless you want it to be a shell, there's not really a purpose of including the language because right. there already is that right. discretion. So we don't have to no. do that because it's already. Yeah. Okay, so we have the waiver of fees. The Mike Donahue issue on page one. Right. Oh. The, I mean that we have left to decide. Yep. The serial communications, the PUC language around um, where is that? Allowing it's. We don't in, have it. But okay. It's coming. Uh, the you have a PUC handout? Yes, no, I have that. But it's not in the Yeah. And do you have one? Um, I don't have a copy. I just I want to take it. Thank you. And if you wouldn't mind going back to it a second. Um, mm -hmm. I just in thinking about how to write something as clear and what you're really trying to get at. So the two subsections, I think, should be read together, right? H mm -hmm. says, existing law says, standard formats shall be as follows. For copies in paper form, a photocopy of a paper record, or a hard copy printout of a public record maintained in electronic form. So that's the standard. Um, and then that gets to this right under existing law that if a uh, record is in electronic form, you have a right to the hard copy. So if you're saying, a public agency that has a record in electronic form has the option of not allowing, you know, not allowing a person to exercise their right to a hard copy, but shall provide a place. I think it's just, this goes back to that whole <laughs> kind of similar concept we were just talking about is just eliminate then the person's right to a hard copy. Then the agency, and you could have a sentence, they may provide a hard copy, but you, you probably okay. don't need to. They know they may. But but th then still, I think that would just be the, the cleanest way. Is, is So if you look on the subsection I, mm -hmm. it says, if an agency maintains public records in electronic format, non-exempt public records shall be available for copying in either the standard electronic form or the standard paper format as designated. So that's that option that you have under existing law. So it sounds like you want to and, and eliminate that option that they have the right to a paper copy. If they are, if the provided that the agency only has it in electronic form and they provide some kind of the right. space. So yeah. Right. So if they only have yeah. a paper copy, we're not insisting that they scan it and make it right. electronic. Right. 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 No, no, this this applies right. to yeah. And then if it's if an agency is a yeah. yeah. And if it's only available <coughs> electronically, then yeah. they have to give you a terminal space. Some space some sort of provide space. you with some kind of access. But yeah. he, he did say if it was a case or two and not sort of volumes of right. stuff that they could print paper. Yeah. Right. The, but they could still choose that under her language. Okay. They can do it paper if they wanted to, or they could just say. All that is electronic. So to me, uh, the construct of saying you can, if it's an electronic, you can have the electronic or have paper. Except we didn't really mean that. You <laughs> don't, you know, it's, I just, it's just easier right. to just right. strike. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, that makes sense. So to do it that way. All right, with the proviso that the yeah agency has to provide some form of access. Okay. Because we do say that they don't have to make a special format. So if their format is electronic, they shouldn't have to make a paper. If their format is paper, they shouldn't have to. Or if they're, it's alphabetical and somebody asks for it um, by date, their format is alphabetical, they don't have to create a new one by date, whatever that means. But they don't have to create a new format to provide the information, right? You're frowning. And Mr. Secretary of State, if, if um, the law says currently, if the agency maintains records in an electronic format, they have to be available in either the standard right, electronic we'll or the standard paper. Right. So, right. so right now, yeah, you know, you, you could, as a requester, choose that. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Just that's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. I just realized we moved on from the ACLU without looking at the second page of cool. it. Okay. Oh, I thought the waiver in a successful court case. I thought that also. Mm -hmm. I don't know that the waiver of fees after denial reversed by a head of agency would make it easier. Why that would apply? I mean, if you somebody makes a decision no, and they appeal to the head of the agency and they reverse that decision, that doesn't shouldn't impact the fees. I don't think. I mean, I don't understand why it would. The last one. There's makes another. Some sort of, all right, so the, what the law says about what you can charge for mm -hmm. under existing law, everyone understands you can only charge after 30 minutes, but what the law says in terms of what you can charge for is um, cost of staff time. Mm -hmm. Well, you can also charge for copies and mailing, but I'm going into staff time. That's where the big dollars are. Mm -hmm. Staff time associated with complying with a request for a copy of a public record. Um, the time directly involved in complying. So directly involved with complying. There is a superior court decision. I'm not aware of any Vermont Supreme Court decision, but there is a decision in 2004 in the Judicial Watch case in which the agency tried to say, um, uh, it was a Governor Dean's documents, there's oh, yeah. tens of thousands of them, and there was a bill that the agency was trying to pass along the requester, tens of thousands of dollars for compiling um, a Vaughn index, which is listing all the records that were going to be withheld or redacted. And the court said that time spent compiling that list, withholding records, is not complying with the request. The court really emphasized that we're complying. And then the only reason I bring that up is I don't know exactly what you can charge for. <laughs> um, there's so many different activities involved with complying with requests, there's the, the searching. I, I think that's clearly would be allowed to be charged for. There's, um, um, then there's, I, I think you can charge for reviewing them for relevance and whether they need to be, whether the actual redacting, which is time consuming, or the fact that the Public Records Act says if you redact or withhold, you have to identify that. And that's very time consuming. Just whether or not you, I have to itemize it or not, that's a whole other can of worms. But um, just by using this language, any fees mm -hmm. assessed for searching, compiling, redacting, and production, I just want to warn you that by including redacting, you're potentially affecting the interpretation, mm -hmm. which I think is unclear right now of whether that can be charged for. I'm not saying it can't, but just by including that here, seems to imply that we think that complying, time spent complying with the request includes redacting. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't find this suggestion. No. Um, what's, the, what, what's that, favorable. You're talking about this one and that one. Yeah. I'm talking about that one in particular. And then the one on the bottom, um, I think the court can, um, other litigation costs incurred, and maybe they can include it in that. But I would also hesitate to put that in there, the next suggestion. Sorry. I agree. All right, so next up. <laughs> so really what we've accepted here is uh, the last one that, that Chloe thought was going to be the hardest to sell. <laughs> I misunderestimated you. Uh-huh. 
Okay, so we have that, and then we have, we made a decision about the AG's office request. And that's okay. what we have left to do, right? And we will do this on Wednesday. I thought we took this suggestion, the second one on the first page. But we no, because it, it's already, they oh, already have the ability to do it. it is. Right. They already have the ability to do it. Okay. And um, I mean, we kind of liked it, but they already have the ability to do it, so. Okay. Um, so we're gonna do this on, I think we're doing this on Wednesday, are we? Yeah. On Wednesday. And um, we will um, make a decision. Yeah, this is Are we going to do the berry thing now, Chair? No, we don't have it on here. Oh, it's. Oh, it's. Let me print you the video. I'm going to need it on this subchapter. Just email it. So we'll do this on Wednesday. Yeah. yeah, we've got it Wednesday, 2 Okay. Well, when you want um, on that case, do you want uh, the... Um, Supreme Court? No, the, the, no, we have it on Thursday at 2.45. It's Thursday, 2.45. Yeah. On the, the Negotiations Committee of Cal it's the longest case name in history of a California Central Supervisor Union versus the Caledonia Central Education Association. Um, do you want copies of the whole opinion? Do you want me no. to summarize? No, we would like to summarize. Summarize. If yeah. anybody wants to yes. read the whole Four opinion. Okay. And so sometimes when there are attorneys on the committees, yeah. they like to read the whole thing. But yeah. You can send them a link. We, they, we, can, we don't have any attorneys on this committee, so um, we're happy to have our attorney yeah. tell Is us that what it too means. late in your process? Because if you want to react to it in some way, do you need something ahead of next Thursday um, in order to no, you, figure I, out if you want? Is there a summary that well, we can maybe. read? Well, maybe. Yeah. That's what plan I can prepare yeah. a summary. And send it to us. Yeah. By when, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're doing this on Thursday, so. Okay. Thank you.